Welcome to the Movers Resource Guide podcast, connecting you to the resources you need to create success. We chat with the best vendors, associations, mentors, movers, and more, giving you the information you need to make your moving company the best it can be. I'm your host, Brian Hassan, CEO of Wayfinder Moving in Buffalo, New York, Apex Moving and Storage in Lakewood, Washington, and the president of the New York State Movers and Warehousemen's Association. Today, I... I'm excited to bring on Robert Wright, Claims Director of Suddeth Government Services. Um, we're going to talk about claims. I promise it won't be boring. Uh, Rob has a lot of energy. Uh, he's he's fun to listen to. He makes claims interesting. He's got a lot of excellent information. So uh, had a great conversation with Rob. Really enjoyed it. Uh, got some laughs in there and uh, got some really, really good information that most people probably don't know about claims. Uh, that can protect you and your company. So really excited for this. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get something out of it. Uh, so without further ado, here's my conversation with Rob. Mm-hmm. All right, Rob, welcome to the Movers Resource Guide. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. By a tail of be wagon. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. I love it. All right. So we uh, we first met and, and got to know each other a little bit through the, uh, how many years ago now? So it was 2016, I think it was 2016. Yeah. Um, through the, AM, the, the defunct old AMSA and their, <laughs> their leaders program. Uh, so we, we got to know each other through the leaders program there and had a good time. Um, so we, we, we tend to, catch up now and again at the conferences and all that. And, uh, when we were, we're at the dispatchers conference, uh, I saw you and I was like, I got to get him on the podcast because there's some great information there. So, um, the only guy willingly got cornered by the claims guy. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, no, so I've, I've watched your career grow right from the leaders program, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, you've kind of advanced and, and now wow. you're, you're this, uh, claims guru, right? So director of claims for Suddeth government services. So you've really over the years, I mean, gained a ton of knowledge and experience and really dove mm-hmm. deep into all things claims in the moving industry. Yep. Yeah. So absolutely. I mean, as, as growing up in this business, like I was, I was on the other side of the dispatch guy for years, right? Mm-hmm. Moving, customers, household goods all across the country. And half of the documentation, I had no idea why I even had it. So when I went to the claims desk, it kind of really, really initiated a a fire within me to really get the information out there because drivers need to know this. There's so much misinformation out there. And that's, that's kind of what I do a lot of the time. It's like, Mythbusters type deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you say drivers, but I can tell you, I'm gonna learn something today. Uh, the other owners that listen to this might learn something, or, or I mean, even even the people filling out the paperwork in the office, right? Like, yeah, I, I think that the claims and 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 even valuation, right? They're similar things, but the, man, they're so confusing sometimes, and there's so many different rules, especially when it comes to doing military work and things like that. That, yeah. Um, Man, you gotta dot your I's and cross your T's and and really understand uh, things. And you know, I went through the claims training class that you now teach. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we'll get into. Uh, t- so tell me about that. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it's the QCA. It's through the um, CPPC. It was formerly the CCA, Certified Claims and Arbitration, through AMSA. Okay. And it was a great program right there, but it focused on interstate transportation. So it didn't really, wasn't really robust enough for agency owners to where, what about locals? What about intra, right? What about real property damage, inconvenience claims? So when AMSA went basically dissolved and went into ATA, the CPPC was able to step up and, and get the CCA. And then we retooled it to make it much more robust training. So um, I'll be teaching it Thursday this week and again this fall, <laughs> but it's it's everything that a claims person or an agency owner 
would need to know to protect their equity because that's ultimately the function of the claims department, both yeah. in protecting your, your brand equity through customer service while balancing cash flow, right? Yeah. So it's a really great Absolutely. program. No, so that's really exciting. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I went through the claims program, my wife and I did, and, and thankfully she went through it because she's smarter than me and retained most of it. But it was a really excellent program. There's very few company owners or, or company personnel that get the opportunity to go through that. And it's such an important piece of the puzzle, right? So uh, I'm really excited that, that you're teaching it. You got a lot of energy and you're, you're fun. So I'm sure it's, it's great. And I know you've retooled it and Yep. Uh, improved it right yep. so um if we'll do this at the end too but if somebody wanted to take that class um would they reach out to you or how would they they go about looking into that they just go to the uh website the cppc website it's claimsnet.org and they go okay. there and then they can sign up for uh the next available class which i believe is fall um I'm not sure what city the conference is then. Yeah. But that, that gets them to it gets them to the website. And right. so uh for for us uh people who don't understand the claims world, so CPPC is the Claims Prevention and Procedures Council. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Awesome. It's it's a really great organization. <laughs> it's full of re, uh repair vendors and TSPs, carriers, the major van lines all participate. Um it's it's a really great learning conference where we really talk about how we how we can prevent claims and also what do we do when they eventually happen right because they will happen just they will they will <laughs> no matter what you do they're gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> okay so um when when talking about claims i, I think a, a lot of times we focus on the back end of claims of, of you know how we fight them and all these other things that are uh, you know, dealing with a customer and all of that stuff. But prior to that, the most important part is preventing claims and having proper documentation. Um, so let's get into the inventory a little bit and let's, let's bust some myths and, and talk about some things on the inventory side. And what are some really important things that we need to know about our inventory? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. This is, um, this is why I get really fired up about, right? Because this is something that we do wrong. We all do it wrong. And I just, I want to get the information out there for people to start reframing their thinking when they're creating an inventory, right? You are creating a chain of custody. And it's supposed to, the exceptions are supposed to be in excess of normal wear. The problem that we have with inventory is there's so much distrust on both sides yeah. where people are trying to protect themselves, the opposite, in fact, happens. Like, I had a conversation with a gentleman at Dispatcher. She said, oh, I train my guys. Every sofa they go up to, they write uh, worn and rubbed on the top rear edge of that sofa. Protects them from claims. So what they're really saying is if they write a bunch of exceptions is they're they're really hurting themselves, not helping yes. themselves if they're not true. So explain right. that to us a little bit. So the, the legal doctrine that applies here is contra pro referendum. It's a Latin term. I don't know why the law uses Latin. I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> but basically what it's stating is when you're – writing a contract because this is basically what it is an inventory is an agreement saying i'm in possession of these items in this condition any ambiguity uncertainty in a contract in an agreement goes against the party that drafted it so by writing ambiguous terms or saying stuff that's not there you can no longer use that inventory and say yeah but this other piece is true sure we were lying up here but this other stuff is is true yeah you know, yeah. this is why it's really important for us to avoid ambiguous terms. Like I am a huge proponent proponent of death to soil. I no longer want to see soil on inventory. It's too ambiguous. <laughs> it's wide open. It never has prevented a claim ever. Okay. All right. So that's a good one. Right. Um, 
But but stepping back, to, I want to make sure we're very clear on this point is that if you put an exception on an inventory that is untrue, uh -huh. where, where you're saying, yes, this uh, this leg, all the legs on, on their dining room chairs have scratches on them. Right. The, the customer could go back and say and use that against you and say, hey, listen, there's no scratches on any of my they're perfect condition. They over inventoried this. This is all untrue. And it basically takes that entire document, crumples it up, throws it away and no longer protects you at all. Correct. Yep. So Absolutely. by over inventorying, if you get a savvy customer, you're in trouble. Yeah. Or if it ends up going to, you know, any type of formal dispute, whether it be arbitration or, you know, in a court case, you know, that's the integrity of that document is going to come into question. And, and like I said, the, the claims that are actually defeated by inventory exceptions are the exceptions that are very clear. You know, we even say like rule of three, like the scratch and that the top right corner, right? You, you have exact location where that is. And when I doubt right out, that's, that's my philosophy, <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, so you don't like soiled. Hate soiled. So we get a dirty couch or a mattress that's a mattress that's got a stain or a couch that's dirty or, you know, been sat in quite a bit. Uh, how do we deal with that then? If we can't write soiled, what do we say? Well, it's not that you can't write soiled. I, I just think it's silly. But I would just write what it is. So if there is a, a 12 by 12 stain, stain in a sofa cushion from somebody sitting in it, you know, mm -hmm. then write that on there. Right? 12 by 12 stain on the okay. sofa cushion. That okay. is going to... That is much more clear than just writing soil, which again, we don't know if it's an oil stain or somebody. Yeah. Plan. So, and that's interesting because I've always shied away. I haven't necessarily taught my guides this, but I've always shied away from writing anything on the inventory that wasn't in the codes and uh, yeah. at the top where it's like SC, yeah. you know, yeah. six. Uh, right. um, so I've, I, yeah, it takes up a lot of space if you write things out, but I just thought it was not proper conduct. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, and this is this is another point that that we had discussed is when I teach inventory, I really live by the philosophy that less is more. What I mean by that is I was brought in. And my dad even taught me there's no perfect piece of furniture. Everything needs an exception. I would argue the exact opposite. I would say there's a finite amount of time that the driver is going to spend on that document. So what's going to give him the best ROI? Look yeah. at the furniture that's important to the customer, the appliances. Write that stuff out. I mean, use a couple lines if you need to. Writing out the words. But... Like the shelf in the garage, just write shelf. Don't spend time trying to make eight chairs unique, you know, <laughs> through exceptions. <laughs> oh, I changed up scratched and rubbed, so this one's this one's better. No, it doesn't. It doesn't protect you against flying. Yeah. It's you're wasting your time. And and, I, and uh, so let's talk about the scratch and rubs on chair because that's one that we we always do here because you look at almost every chair not every chair right mm -hmm. but, but many chairs have little scratches or rubs or you know gouges in the seat from your uh, the pins on your jeans or whatever not big ones but little lines and stuff sure and so when you talk about ROI yes we could inventory all those chairs like that yeah. but that's normal wear and tear that most have so you're saying our return on investment the time it takes to write those out in most cases is probably not worth the time yeah because you're not seeing a lot of claims on those correct i'm not seeing that when you see a claim the claims that get to us are legitimate damage or there's not like we're going to have a repair firm go out there in all likelihood and they're going to be able to look at it and say this is normal wear whether it's on the inventory or not the re normal repair people can make that determination saying, yeah, this is from the vacuum cleaner hitting the legs. That's not what we're seeing. 
And the yeah. problem is, is the time that you took to write those eight chairs up. Now you've got the crew staging all the stuff. They're waiting for you to get in there and load your truck. So you're rushing at the end of it and you miss something else that really would have protected you. That's you know, an excellent point. And that happens, you know, as a guy with his a, who's been out there in the hot summers, uh, yeah, it happens hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Right. So that's why I, I always preach this is it's an investment. Look at it, at the inventory as an investment, ask the customer what's important to them. What really matters to them? Where's their cherry wood furniture? You know, take the time, write that stuff up, but you know, don't write exceptions on a shovel. I mean, you don't need to. <laughs> It's yeah, and I, and, I and really that shovel plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I do I say shovel. I, that's that's one I don't go into detail on. Um, <laughs> but but you're saying too, you know, um, it, you can breeze through a lot of it and just put the piece down if it's in good shape, if if it's normal wear and tear. But take the time on that piece that the that the customer is really concerned about. Which is yeah. why we asked that question, what are you really concerned about? And we can make sure we we do those pieces really well. And then any other, you know, major damage, like, dude, the leg is broken. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally broken. Or there's, you know, a, a, a really bad gouge in the center of their dining room table that's a, very right. obviously noticeable. Yep. Right? That's kind of what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And then <clears throat> it's important that you, you look at the pieces that matter for exceptions that's that's a really key piece but another key piece is understanding that this document is a chain of custody we see claims that really go sideways where people miss that concept and what i mean by this we see a lot in overflows so driver inventory is a whole house right in the beginning of the day right yeah thinking he's gonna get it you know he ends up yep. missing it by a couple thousand pounds whatever sure well, then he just leaves and doesn't do anything with that inventory. And that's the problem because with that inventory, you're effectively saying, you and your customer both sign, I'm in possession of these items in this condition. What the driver should have done is void off any items that are still in the house because you didn't take custody of them. Yeah. But then on the customer side, when it delivers... Now there's the original inventory with 2,000 pounds that didn't go with the main shipment. The other, the other um, company did an overflow inventory, and they didn't cross-reference the first one. So now the customer doesn't know what's missing. So that's where we see a lot of missing item claims that just go completely south. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So with that, yeah. though, you get the customer to sign off before or you have them sign that and the copy they have has the voided ones. You can't give them their copy, then realize you haven't. Right. <laughs> you, you can't get everything and then void it out because yeah. then it looks like you stole it. <laughs> yeah, you can't alter the document after it's after it's signed. That's that's not a good thing to do. No, no. <laughs> okay. So and any other high points here for uh, inventory? Any Anything else we should know about? Yeah, I would talk about um, delivery in, in particular, right? When I talk about chain of custody and then documenting um, items were delivered, making sure that you check off the inventory is going to be really important. But we have seen circumstance where the shipment delivered and... This one particular instance, there was 10 totes that delivered with no number, right? Okay. That was number 100 through 109. So the customer at the time of delivery, they didn't check off 100 through 109, those totes, and they listed 100 through 109 on the NOLD. It was military. So formerly known as 1850. It's now not an 1850 <laughs> anymore. Uh, but they noted that, and then the driver signed it. So he's effectively saying, I agree that these 10 items were missing. So while you cannot prevent the customer from writing whatever they want on the documentation, the same goes for you. 
So what the driver should have done in that instance is he should have wrote 10 totes delivered with no number. So sure, 100 and 109 wasn't there. Effectively, those numbers are missing. But if you close that chain of custody and say, yeah, but I delivered 10 totes with no number, then we can account for that and protect yourself against the claim. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. And I really... I, I, I'm sure it doesn't happen often. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it's... I, I think a lot of drivers are just hoping that the customer doesn't claim that because they're not paying attention. And I, sure. I suppose if the customer's actually writing it down, maybe they would. But sure. um. <laughs> and odds are, odds are that, you know, the driver wasn't saying that it was somebody else's fault. I mean, in this industry, we have a real bad habit of blaming the other guys. <laughs> We're really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, maybe moving on from inventory a little bit, um, let, let's talk about the biggest claims. W what are the things that cost people the what? most money and cause the most issues? And I know there's one big one, maybe we can get into a couple others, but, sure. um, what, what are the biggest things that, that cost us money that maybe we want to pay the most attention to? Well, I would say, um, the biggest claim item that we see, at least the most frequent, um, we see TVs a lot. And we see TVs without evidence of physical damage. Now, I want to be clear. MCU does not protect you. It's not this magical <laughs> notation that protects you from... from because the, mili the military no longer re uh, recognizes that, correct? Right. But so, even even so, it it was a useless term to begin with because you're just saying mechanical condition unknown. You're just saying you don't yeah. know. Well, I can tell you this: that any driver is not going to be likely, very likely, not going to be qualified to tell me if all the functionality of the TV is working, if all the inputs are working, if volumes work properly. He's not going to be able to tell me that. But he sure is qualified to tell me if it's not working. So write not working. <laughs> write that on the inventory. Don't so write MCU. Not, <laughs> not MCU. Not working. <laughs> like, because it's challenging, right? Like, effectively in the mobile industry, with things like this, we're almost tasked with warranting items that we neither manufacture nor maintain, which makes it very challenging. So, while I'm not a big proponent of plugging stuff in and, and turning it on, there's been several instances where the customer has even communicated to the crews, yeah, that TV in the garage, yeah, it doesn't work. Okay. What? Why don't you write that? Right. You know? Write it down. And then and, the, and other that's... Big, the other big issue, just, just to footstop this one, is mattresses. We mm -hmm. have this awful habit of never writing conditions for a mattress. One of the most expensive items in the home, a lot of times up to $4,000, and we're just writing CP. Mattress is in a box or a bag, but yeah, not that it's torn, but there's any soil marks, anything like that. And then we're stuck. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think I see that a lot when we bring in stuff to our warehouse that the, the mattresses are, are very rarely um, mm -hmm. paid attention to. Yeah. More or less. Just, just and... send it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> um, but once again, now myself, that's when I, I tend to write soiled on. <laughs> so <laughs> if it is, uh, so... <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> no, so so be specific about it though. Of yep. of you know, yeah, that looks like a pea stain, or yeah, it's dirty yep. on this corner. You know, use your your markers for the corners yeah. and whatnot. Maybe maybe don't inference what the stain is. If you say, <laughs> you know, stain twelve by twelve stain. You can maybe okay. reference a color if you feel the need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't 
I don't know how happy the customer is going to be. <laughs> you agree? Yeah, there's pee stains all over my mattress. <laughs> <laughs> um, and is that you know? And I would imagine a lot of the the claims that come from the mattresses are, um, yeah, it was put in a bag and then the bag got ripped and it slid on the ground and and there yeah. you go. Now it's uh, now yeah. it's soiled. Yeah, that or torn handles. I mean. Mm. Movers have to understand that the handles on mattresses are not designed for moving. No. We are not supposed to grab it by the handles, and we still do. But <laughs> many times, if, if they're not putting it in a bag, then they got to put it in a box. Those boxes are big, bulky. You need room to do it. So they have to carry the mattress outside, and which is really counterintuitive because you know you're gonna get a lot more damage carrying it through a narrow passage you know with twists and turns rather than a big wide open truck so yeah. you know that's a whole nother conversation about guys that pad on the truck that makes no sense to me i uh, yeah i agree yeah because that's <laughs> that's you know yes you're gonna get rubs along a long trip uh but but yeah most of your right. damage is is coming in and out of the house right so that's that's where we see a lot of the the damage to the mattress is they're carrying the mattress and there's a they dropped it in the grass or something and there's a, a rub mark or the handles torn or you know something along those lines there's dirt marks on it yeah. And I'll yeah. just put it on the garage floor or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So we are, I, I'm well past this because I forgot to do it. So uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, a funny moving story or a funny, it's a claim story. I know it's going to be a claim story. So tell me about a crazy or interesting or funny claims uh, situation. Oh, man. So, um, Yeah. Well, the only one I can think of is it's one we've had, uh, you know, that's happened where a a member went to Tampa. He he lived in his house was in Chicago, so he's moving from Chicago to Tampa. But he went to Tampa and he was working there for six months. So he comes back and we're there to to, to move his stuff and um. There was nine cats that were left in that house for six months. <laughs> oh my gosh. So like we get the stuff loaded up and then the shipment turned into this whole fiasco because the whole thing smelled like cat pee. <laughs> and it was the fact that no we way. contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that we loaded it was was already it was dumb that we did that. Um and this is not so this is from my days of old. But it turned into this massive claim, and he was just so surprised that his stuff smelled like cat pee. He was like, "Are you? Do you know what happens to your cats <laughs> <laughs> when you were gone? What did you think this was gonna be?" Oh my gosh, I can't imagine how bad their eyes burned. I've been into customers' houses yeah. that have cats that have peed, and it's just like <laughs> you know to do a quote or whatever, and you're just you can't get out of there quick enough. I mean, the ammonia is like. It's strong. I can't believe the crew did it. I can't believe they yeah. went through with this. Yeah, yeah. Like, you got to think like at some point during the day, they had to go to like some awful piece in the basement or something and look at each other and be like, "Should we do this, man?" <laughs> Just on the walkthrough, like, I oh my gosh, I can't imagine. Yeah, uh, how they stay alive for that long? I don't know. <laughs> me, like, unfortunately. Wow. We've, we've moved some cats before. <laughs> I've had a cat scurry. Uh, it's one of these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving animals. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. So uh, it just popped into my head. So we, we moved somebody from Florida up, up to Buffalo in the winter. Mm -hmm. And we're unloading the, the truck into storage. And one of those little geckos or lizards or whatever was in the truck mm -hmm. and you know went and picked it up solid as a rock right yep so <laughs> put it in like a cool whip container or something put it in the office because i was going to scare the girls with it later <laughs> so i don't know four or five hours later the next day whatever it was went to open up the cool whip container like ah <laughs> and the damn thing jumps out <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> 
and uh showed you yeah yeah i uh i got in trouble for that one so <laughs> <laughs> they were not happy with me and now um, his name's frank and he's still living in your office right? <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, I appreciate that uh, that funny story for us. Um, all right. So, so mattresses and TVs, you would say, are the things that are claimed the most often, right? Yeah, Is that probably the most common things. So, what are the things that, in in a single claim, cost people the most money that that we need to be aware of? Um. I think what I really think what impacts the bottom line and what's most expensive is real property damage. That okay. would be my my number one thing. I can't harp on that enough um, to do good in home protection. I mean, I, I kind of a I can draw a parallel to like a restaurant waiter, right? When you're making that first impression, because they make a good impression. You're going to be making excuses for him. Ah, yeah, I know it takes a minute, but he's busy in here. They don't. Your hobby's going to be cutting that dude down for the rest of the meal. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine a mover that's there all day and he doesn't make that first impression. So the real property damage really helps prevent claims just from the first impression, just doing yeah. good uh, in-home protection. Yeah. But also, when it comes to real property damage... That's not adjudicated under cargo liability. That's actually under your auto policy. Yeah. Right? So in car in cargo, we're protected from sentimental, consequential, punitive damages under the Carmack Amendment. So mm -hmm. if we damage your laundry or your washer, we're not liable to wash your clothes till you get a new one. Right. That's not the case <laughs> in real property damage. If you scratch a floor and they no longer have that you know, floorboard or whatever. They got to refloor the whole house. And then because they refloor, they got to tear up the baseboards and repaint all the walls. Those dominoes fall and you got to pay for all of that. Yeah. And that could all happen from one small little scratch. So in-home protection is the biggest thing. Um, the biggest potential claims liability, you know, Guys hooking up water yeah. lines, or it's too old and it breaks, and then water's all over the place. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, it, at least in New York State, it says right in the uh, the mover's guide book that every customer is supposed to get that we're not allowed to hook up and unhook washers and dryers and things like that, and that's why. So Correct. if something goes wrong, we're not plumbers. We're not. You know, we we don't know how to fix it, and right. your house can flood. So, real and, quick, and it's happened. I've seen those claims. <laughs> I have, and it's it's not great. Those things get ugly fast. Oh, oh I bet, I bet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, and and let's talk about. Let's just touch on it real quick. Uh, the the big one, especially in the military, but for anybody really, um, mm -hmm. is is mold, right? Yeah. Oof. Gotta bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> so so what's the what's the What's the proper procedure if people see mold in a house? And then how do we distinguish between harmful mold and or, or what should be the proper procedure between something that potentially could be harmful mold? And maybe they just got a little bit of mold on the back of a uh, dresser or something that's not super yeah. harmful. Like, how's how do we determine those? Well, this is a very it's a very tough question. <laughs> Very loaded question. I appreciate you giving this to me. Thanks. Uh, I, I try to send a good one for the end. Right? Yeah, I know. Well, mold is relative to the environment. So there's no national standard for an acceptable amount of mold, right? Or what's deemed to be dangerous, which most mold is benign. Um, but again, only an industrial hygienist will be able to tell you. But I live in Florida. I mean, the entire state is like a sweaty gym sock, right? It's full of mold. <laughs> but yes. the mold that I have in the air here would be significantly higher than that in like Arizona, right? So it's mold levels are really relative to that particular environment. The 
biggest thing I would say is if, if there is mold on an item, then just don't take it, right? And, and movers have to get better at, at looking for these things because mold doesn't grow in places where it's bright and sunny. So the customer may not see the mold underneath the dresser. We take it. As soon as we take it into our custody, we bought it's a problem. it. Yeah. You know? So and identify. If you're in one of those uh, high moisture areas of the country and you throw something on your truck and it sits there for a few days, all of a sudden that whole yes. shipment could be full yeah. of mold. The whole shipment and then you're you're you know making Surf Pro's yacht payment. Because yeah. <laughs> they have one, I yeah. can tell you. <laughs> I want. I want to talk about that. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I would just say that you s- tell the guys you situational awareness. Make sure that you're actually inspecting the items, and if there is something with mold on it, don't take it. Bring it to the customer's attention. You know, this has been a really hot ticket item and i get it when i was mover we were just there to move you i wasn't looking for this stuff yeah. right i just know yeah. that your stuff needs to be on my truck and to your new place but times have changed things have changed we have to be cognizant of this because the risk is significant yeah 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 for sure mm-hmm. all right sir well uh Thank you. Are there, before we close out here, any, uh, anything else that that's on your list that we need to know that we haven't covered yet? Yes. The one, one thing I do want to touch on just real quick Mm -hmm. is the high value. There is such a misconception about this document. And I, I've been trying to, to break this, you know, this myths about this thing for years now. But people don't understand the high value was actually created for industry. It helps both the industry and the customer. Yeah. Now, you want to give that customer the opportunity to list everything on there. So at delivery, those items, they're initial and signed for. Now there's no filing it that's missing later. That's It's ballgame right, at that yep. point. Yep. But more importantly, a properly used high value, its biggest asset is not the document, not what's on it. It's about what's not on it. Because the liability for everything else is going to be less than $100 per pound. pound. So if if customer A has a properly filled high value and they say they're missing the Mona Lisa and it's not on that document... $100 Hundred dollars per pound. I mean, that's not what they're going to get. They would have to substantiate that they have something of high value. Because why didn't they list it? Right. You know. So yeah. again, use the document. It only helps you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 kind of, you know, the the example that I always used is, hey, if the customer has you know a box that's missing and and it's not on the high value or you didn't present them with the high value inventory. And then that box is missing. Oh, gee, that's the box I had with all my jewelry in it. There's like a hundred thousand dollars of jewelry in there, yep. and mm-hmm. and they can make that claim. And there's not much you could say about it necessarily. I mean, if mm-hmm. if you didn't do the high value, but if you have the high value wasn't listed on there, you're protected against it. If it is listed on there, you make sure you get it signed off for uh, on delivery, and you're all good. Absolutely, absolutely. Again. It, it helps you in, in a lot of different ways. And plus, once stuff is listed on a high value, it generally has a heightened sense of awareness Yeah. because it's on there. And claims for stuff on high value is is low. I'm okay. saying that knocking. <laughs> <laughs> but it, normally, it's, it's low. But it also gets us to the truth faster. Claims would be so much better for everyone involved if everyone was just straightforward and honest with it, like yeah. straightforward and honest with the documentation, let's get to the truth faster. Cause I promise we pay for more damage than we cause right now. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's great. And I think, you know, um, one of the things that I want to bring back to my team after this is, Hey, let's spend a lot less time on 
crazy stuff on the inventory, like on, on okay. most things on the inventory. Let's let's take the time that we use to do inventory, shrink it down. Yeah. Inventory, you know, don't worry about all the exceptions on the things that are normal, and just focus on the big things, and probably cut our time down on inventory quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we don't over inventory because I learned that in the class, but I think we can even scale that back a little bit more. And, and mm -hmm. like you said, it's, it's an ROI thing, right? Yeah. Um, what actually, what actually makes a difference, you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. We, we good. Anything else? I got time for you. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's all I had on my list. Honestly, just encouraging people to speak, straightforward that would be it would be a win-win on both sides awesome <laughs> all right sir uh i think this was enlightening for me hopefully it was for everybody else i know i learned some things here i appreciate you appreciate you taking the time um if uh if somebody wanted to reach out to you uh maybe take your class talk talk to you about some things uh how would they get to you sure email me my email is robert.right at southern.com Email me questions, comments. If you want to know how to sign up for the class? You just want to talk moving. All right, I love this crap. All right, <laughs> <laughs> and you do. Like you, you get into it, and and man, I, I respect the hell out of it because it's not a, a fun topic for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But you do make it interesting. You make it easy to talk about it. Uh, so mm -hmm. I appreciate that for sure. Um, but yeah, man, thanks for coming on and. Uh, Look forward to seeing you at the, uh, at the next event. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Brian. All right. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the entire podcast. We appreciate you listening. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want to uh, reach out to, to Rob and have a conversation with him, have any questions for him, he can be reached at robert.right, W. R I G H T at suddeth.com. And uh, if you're interested in taking his claims course, uh, which I highly suggest, you're going to learn a lot from it. Uh, if you have somebody in your organization that is, is focused on doing your claims, I think it's a great idea. Uh, we took the course seven, whatever years ago, we still have our book from it that we use when we go through our claims. Um, I know Robert's improved it and made it better. So uh, I'm sure it's even even better than when we took it. Um, but that's by the Claims Prevention and Procedure Council. And you can uh, get to their website by going to claimsnet.org. Um, and the, the most recent class is posted up there that's being taught this week. Um, and then just keep an eye on it for the fall uh, when, his, when his future classes uh, come. But I uh, thought it was a great conversation with Robert. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. Uh, so once again, thank, thank Rob for his time and uh, appreciate him taking the time to come on. Um, just a reminder, you can listen to us everywhere you listen to your podcast. We're not just on YouTube. We're, we're on all the podcast channels. So uh, check us out uh, wherever you listen to your audio podcasts. We should be there. Um, if you have any questions, any suggestions for future episodes, uh, send us an email, uh, moversresourceguide at gmail.com. Uh, once again, appreciate everyone. Thank you for listening. Now get moving. <laughs>